Hey guys, welcome to today's video where I'm going to give you a walkthrough and update on the remodeling progress at the Kayak Bass Fishing Headquarters, what the future plans are, and why you should care about what exactly is the Kayak Bass Fishing Headquarters. Fish on! That's a toad, brother. Golly! All right, so we're going to start off over here where I'm going to show you one of the things that we're going to have to wait a little bit on, which is we're going to take this window out and put a double door here, and then we're going to take the fence and go from this corner across so that we can come around the back and pull in and put kayaks all into our rigging shop. And that's where the vast majority of our product development, research is gonna happen, but also, you know, where you knuckleheads can stop by if you're in town and we can help you rig your fishing kayaks out. For the front of the building, I gotta thank David Blankenship who drove over from Georgia and volunteered his time. Honestly, guys, without him and the support of this entire community, getting this project off of the ground and moving and progressing as fast as it is, wouldn't even be possible. So David took my vision of transforming the front uh, doors and windows into a billboard or facade and basically framed in the existing windows on both sides, framed the door in, and we used this distressed barn wood that was donated to us by Dan Hardy. And Dan is the chapter coordinator for the North Alabama Heroes on the Water chapter. So, you know, Dan feels passionate about this facility because it's going to be a great place for us to meet uh, and have events with veterans in North Alabama or ones that want to travel in, you know, from all over the country. So I appreciate Dan for helping us out with this, um, this uh, cedar that really gives us a really nice accent piece. Now, at Ditto Landing, there's a lot of development going on, and it's a big reason why Kayak Bass Fishing chose to be here. For one, it's centrally located in North Alabama. Two, it's literally right on the water. Um, and right down the road from me, between here and the Ditto Landing Marina, uh, they've put in a huge road project to connect the Tennessee River waterfront with um, Hobbs Island Road so that it allows for future development of the waterfront with restaurants and shops and, you know, a whole bunch of other things that are planned. But what's really cool is the next phase of that is a road is going to be coming in off of the main road here directly into the front of the KBF headquarters. So the vision for the front of this building is to drop a couple of big columns off of the corners of this dormer, put something to cover uh, across the front, give it an accent piece, have some lights that shine up on our signs that are gonna go on both sides that are gonna talk about upcoming events, how you can find out more about who and what kayak bass fishing is, and give us an opportunity to grow you know, our outreach in the community. And so to break up your eye line for the fact that a door even used to be there, again, we're gonna drop some columns, put a, you know, like a false fence there, and then hide the lighting behind that to shine up on the wall. The reason that that's pretty cool is it's going to allow us to have eyeballs coming in off of the main road. And then when we do our projects and our classes and our demonstrations out here in the cove that's off of the back channel of the Tennessee River, it's also gonna allow us to use this side of the building for when people are coming and going from the boat ramp. And this is actually a really busy boat ramp in the spring and summer and up into the later part of the fall. So it's gonna give us an opportunity to really represent our brand you know, to those folks that are coming and going and help them learn more about kayak fishing, kayak bass fishing, but more importantly, paddle sports safety and ways that they can get involved in helping us with veterans outreach and youth outreach programs. So we, did, we took the same concept and David framed in the two windows that used to make up the kitchen windows, gives us a little bit of added security on the outside and it puts all easy access points behind the fence that is gated and, uh, and has an access code but it also makes up a really nice facade. So again, when you're coming from the busiest place in this area, you've got a direct shot at the front of the building and we trim the trees up, probably even gonna remove those to make it look even cleaner. And this is also just kind of being part of the, you know, facelift that Ditto Landing is getting for all of the stuff that's coming in the future. So that's what's going on on the outside. Now I'm gonna take you guys on the inside and show you where Ryan Rice, uh, RJM, uh, Fishtails on YouTube. I'll put a link in the description box for you guys to go follow his channel. Let's help that knucklehead get a thousand subscribers, help him get monetized so he can also do more good for the community. Uh, but man, I got to say, I wouldn't have be anywhere near where I'm at if it wasn't for David and Ryan and tons of other folks that are stopping by and volunteering an hour or two hours or half a day or whatever they have. So this really is our building. It's, it's going to be built by the community, owned by the community, uh, and hopefully benefit the community. So that's the goal. Let's take a look inside. All right, so we're just gonna start right when you walk in the front door. Um, we basically gutted this room, decided to uh, keep the paneling in here because it's in good shape. We literally have zero budget, 
you know, for this thing. And um, so we're repurposing, you know, and borrowing, finding, reclaiming everything that we possibly can. And so since this is in still pretty good shape, um, we decided to leave it as it is. We're gonna slap a coat of paint on it, throw a couple of pieces of accent board in, um, and it, I'm just gonna leave the shelf where it's at. And then I've gotta get a plumber to come in and kind of help me figure out some of this stuff here so we can put a washer and dryer in here down the road for when we teach classes where folks end up getting wet. We basically are gonna use this as a mud room. Uh, we're gonna build a bench in here and that bench is probably gonna be kind of an extension of the workstation, a charging station for batteries for folks that are you know, filming with me or coming in on a guided trip or something like that. Uh, basically just a power station where we can keep all of our Dakota lithium stuff juiced up and ready for our next adventure. A uh, little utility closet right here that I got packed full of gear. Uh, and then coming on into the kitchen, this is where the real progress was made. And I'm referring to this as the kitchen because this was the kitchen. No longer the kitchen. And again, big shout out to Ryan. Ryan came in here with the vision and said, dude, listen, why don't we just cover the walls with plywood, throw in some extra supports and studs. That way it makes it easy for you to mount stuff to the wall if you want to put cabinets back up. You know, if you want to put grid wall for hanging tools and things like that. So we decided to go with the least expensive plywood we can find that still serves the purpose. And so this stuff right here, you know, isn't the smoothest finish, but I'm going to get in here uh, with some caulk, caulk all the gaps, caulk all the, you know, the ugly spots, smooth it down. It's paintable caulk. And then when we're done, I'm just going to come back through here and paint this all up. What this is going to serve as, as an extension of the workshop. This will be where the smaller projects happen you know, lure craft, tackles, you know, modifying a part to go back on a kayak that we're working on uh, out in the main shop. And then we decided to use these windows uh, by repurposing some uh, wood that was left in here, some particle board as the backdrop. And then Ryan also cased the windows with that same wood because again, we had it and then threw a little shelf in here. And we're gonna ultimately come up with some kind of facelift for this thing, put a strip across here, put a strip across here, hide some lights behind it, you know, do some stuff like this with some um, old trophies and, and trophies that had maybe a, 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 a glitch or something. And uh, the folks at Yak Attack and Catch repurpose them and then we can still use these. One of the things that's also happening, as you notice, I've got some signs pulled up. I've got some of these trophies out because what those are doing is they're serving as a reminder for me while I'm going through this project that I kind of took my eye off the prize for a little while I got overwhelmed, I overcommitted, overpromised with KBF, and these signs of our biggest events and the things that I, we're most proud of accomplishing are a reminder to get back to that. They're a reminder to, you know, stay grounded and don't try to do more than you can. And so again, when you see some of this stuff around, that's not any kind of brand placement for this video. It's actually me motivating myself. Every day when I walk in here and I see those things, it takes me back to like where we were then and then sets the pathway for me to get back there. So I know it sounds maybe corny, um, but it is what it is. I got to mention this because it's one of those things that I don't, I don't get to talk about enough, but the folks at Dakota Lithium literally do power my outdoor passion, both financially and with the best gear in the game. And so um, this power box series, both the 60 that I've been using for this project and then the, the 135 that Austin's been using for a bunch of filming keeping gear powered up on the road, keeping cameras charged is the best portable power in the game. We've been using it for this project and literally anywhere you don't have power, you don't have to worry because you got it with Dakota. They got your back. Uh, so Ryan built this awesome, like bulletproof um, work desk in here, or I'm sorry, uh, what am I calling this thing? I'm drawing a blank now. What's this called? Workbench. So it's a workbench desk. Anyway, so we got a, a pretty sweet workbench in here uh, with a lot of underneath storage for bigger stuff. We made it to where even if you're taller, you're not having to bend over, you know, and it's just going to be a cool place to create. The one thing that has happened to me over the last five to six years is, you know, with selling my shop, um, I took a bunch of stuff and threw it in storage. Then with getting married and kind of merging my life with somebody else's life, I just kind of threw a bunch of stuff in storage. So I've literally had, you know, my life in turmoil for probably six to 10 years. And what this is allowing me to do is really get back to doing the things that I love, which is developing awesome products, developing ideas that we all benefit, you know, in this industry. 
A lot of folks don't know this. Um, you know, I play a fat redneck on TV and in real life, but I have a um, aeronautical series of aeronautical degrees from Embry Riddle, and I spent most of my adult life in the aviation industry. You know, so a lot of the developments and advancements in kayak fishing I've been a part of, and, I've pr and I'm proud of that, but I got away from it for a few years. And so now it's time to get back into that part of my life to explore that part of my my makeup and the thing that really makes me happy. And, I, I, you know, going through this process of the divorce and dealing with PTSD and learning how to grieve and all these other things, I also learned how to think about what's important to me and prioritize things and creating and building and making and sharing are those things that I love. Uh, you know, I spearheaded the remodeling of my shop when I had Hook One. And I think when it was all said and done, it was one of, if not the most beautiful shops in the country. And so that's what's really motivated me to take a hands-on approach to being involved in this. You know, even though these other knuckleheads are doing the vast majority of the work, I'm just running around trying to do everything that I can with my limited skill sets when it comes to remodeling, watching a ton of YouTube videos, checking out my buddy John uh, Malecki's channel, John the Builder, to just, you know, embrace that side of, of creating. And it's, it's been fun. So the vision in here is to fill these walls, sand them down a little bit in bad spots, and then just come in and paint the whole thing. Uh, we're gonna rip these floors out and just stain the concrete. I'm gonna make an accent wall over here and probably add a couple more cabinets. I'm gonna take all the cabinets that come out of here and figure out which ones will fit best there. And then we're gonna remount a set of cabinets there so we've got some, you know, some extra storage. Create a little accent wall over here. Probably gonna pretty much leave this wall bare with the exception of mounting some grid wall and hanging some products on there. So that if we're doing a project, We've got the products right here. We can take them off the wall and then move right into the project. Same thing with lure craft and things like that. Just give us some places to hang stuff throughout the creative process. So coming on into the part that I'm probably equally as excited about for the media room is the shop because the shop is really the rigging media room. Now, I'll apologize in advance. It's pretty echoey in here because we completely boarded everything off. There's going to be some really expensive gear in here and some projects going on with both, you know, kayaks that are being modified in work as well as kayaks that don't necessarily belong to me. So I want this room to be like Fort Knox. If you come here and we're rigging your kayak out and it's taken more than a day, I want you to sleep at ease when we leave the kayak in here at night and we lock it up and we go home. And we're just going to turn this into the ultimate rigging studio slash workshop. This is also one of the places where I want to flex my creative side. A lot of folks don't know this, but I'm actually an artist and I'm not breaking my arm, patting myself on the back, but I'm pretty dang good at it. And I just haven't done it for 20 years. And so with having an office and a place to set up my desk and a place to get out my pencils and watercolors and crayons and those things that have literally been in storage for since I retired from the Navy at a minimum and probably even longer than that, I'm going to get back to doing some of that stuff. So I've got some ideas for doing some murals on the wall, maybe making some some canvases that can hang over some of these spots or just you know do the artwork and then have it printed digitally and I don't know yet I'm just saying that's what we've done so far and I've got a really specific vision for how this room is going to end up and I think you guys are going to really like it a uh, big shout out to the dude standing behind the camera Austin the other Hoover uh, he is the uh, the hold on he's responsible for helping get these this place lighted up uh, Austin's former career uh, he was a pretty accomplished electrician, so he went and helped me pick out the right lights uh, to set this thing off. It had some ugly 1950s lights in here, and now we've got beautiful light. We're obviously going to use some supplemental lighting. He did the same thing in here uh, over the workbench, both he and Ryan. So Ryan's a, an electrical contractor, designer, project manager, uh, and then the same thing over here in the media room slash podcast studio. But before we go there, I want to show you guys something that's pretty cool. When these guys were rigging the lights, check out what was in the ceiling. So come in here a little bit closer. I want to show you this. A lot of you guys that are older and my age are going to remember Reader's Digest. But this is actually a, a blast from the past. It's kind of cool. There's a January 87 and an August 1988 Reader's Digest. Look at some of the titles on here. Like, The Day the Challenger Exploded. So I was, you know, 12 years old when the Challenger exploded. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was sitting in my class, like a lot of you guys were. The teachers all rolled the TV into the room. 
and the space shuttle was taken off because if you remember, it had Kristen McAuliffe on it, which was a school teacher. So all the schools around the world were celebrating the fact that she was the first um, teacher in going into space. And however long it was into the thing, you know, a minute and a half or so, never even reached the atmosphere. The Challenger rocket exploded, the Challenger exploded, and every kid in America was traumatized. And if you were of school age and watching that, you'll never forget the year. <laughs> you'll never forget the Challenger exploded. So it's pretty crazy to see that on this Reader's Digest, um, it says the day the Challenger expo exploded. So I'm going to go back and watch that. Ironically enough, I'm actually researching this topic myself right now, 30 years later. Uh, a cure for doctors who are hazardous to your health. A lot of doctor's advice is based on telling you what's good for them because they get you know, supplementation from pharmaceutical companies and things like that. So I'm gonna read that and kind of see where it's at. But check this one out right here. This one's gonna be interesting. I'm really looking forward to reading this one because we probably live in some of the craziest times as a country. We're probably the most divided we've ever been. But I wanna see what their thoughts were in January of 1987 when it says, life in these United States. <laughs> on page 121. So I'm gonna read that, I'm gonna catch up on it. There's some really cool stuff on here uh, as well. Um, is English spoken here is one of the topics. Like I don't even think you could write that article today. And um, a boy, a snake and an angel. What? Confessions of a modern mom from almost 40 years ago. So again, pretty cool find. Just shows you how freaking old this building is and how long ago these lights were put in and the last time somebody messed around inside these walls or inside the ceiling. So now coming on in here, this is gonna be, as they say, where the magic happens. And when I say the magic, what I mean is, this is where we're gonna to get to create the vast majority of our content. It's gonna allow me to accelerate the sharing of knowledge, the sharing of expense, experiences. It's gonna allow me to truly um, jump into the podcast creation thing because I don't wanna just do podcasts about tournaments anymore. I wanna do podcasts about things that make you better as an angler, things that give you insight. You know, uh, hook up with one of my friends who's an elite series pro, who's an accomplished jig fisherman, and have a full, you know, 45 minute to an hour discussion about how to be a better jig fisherman, where, when, why, how to fish jigs. And a podcast that's truly something that you can get entertainment from, but you also get value from. It's something that you can maybe come back to, you know, year after year, uh, to make you a better angler. So that's what this studio is going to be for. It's going to be for sh shooting shorter form content. It's going to be for shooting discussion type format. It's going to be for bringing in, you know, friends and sponsors and, you know, all of the influencers that are team captains for the, the Knucklehead Bass Fishing Series. And it's really just going to give me a, a place to have an opportunity to create content without having to, you know, get the whole system set up every single time. Living in a camper trying to use it as my podcast studio has been a pain in the butt because it takes, you know, 35, 45, an hour to get set up each time. Then you do the podcast and you have to break it down and it's where you live. So this is truly going to give us an opportunity to flex our creative muscle um, and dive into a lot of topics that are out there. You know, one idea that I have, and I'd love to hear you guys' feedback on it, is I think I want to do like a weekly roundup of all the best fishing videos that I watch that I think you should watch provide commentary on it and give you kind of like a one-stop shop for finding the best videos just based on my recommendation and then create a dialogue that helps those videos get some more get some more blah, 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 and create a dialogue that helps those videos get more views while simultaneously helping us grow the channel by interacting with those other channels and those topics so you guys leave me a comment in the comment section below would you like to see like a Friday weekly roundup video series if that, if that makes sense uh, so again, real simple in here, uh, we've got this really cool table that uh, a gentleman named Mike McKinstry made for me a long time ago. We're going to use that table top as an accent piece, and then we're going to use this table. That's the one Mike made. Um, and we're going to use that as the podcast table. And uh, again, we're going to get this thing set up. Uh, we've got an old couch in here, you know, from the pre-divorce days that we're just going to throw in the corner. Um, the guys from Auburn had a really funny thing that they were going to do. Um, <laughs> they called it the casting couch. I don't think we could get away with doing that, but I think it's funny that we're going to bring some folks in here and have some conversations before we go live and things like this. So this is going to be the, like the make ready spot. 
This is going to be the spot where you can hang out, chill, and just kind of experience being here. Coming on back, these are going to be real simple. Uh, this is going to be one office. We haven't exactly decided whose or what yet. Nothing fancy going on in here. We're actually just going to take all the nails out of the wall, paint the walls to give it a fresh look, probably paint the ceiling to brighten it up in here a little bit, replace the blinds, get rid of all this junk that's in here, and then just um, organize it. That's simple. Uh, like I talked about before, I put up some of our signage and banner, the Gunnersville National Championship that we did, even though COVID was going on, you know, it's something that we're re really proud of. I obviously have had a love affair with North Alabama, Lake Gunnersville, Lake Wheeler, Weiss, you know, Bear Creek. Honestly, every river down the, the Tennessee River chain through North Alabama, like has a special place for me. Certain times Pickwick's the best, certain times Wilson, you know, is the best. And Gunnersville and Wheeler are two of my favorites. So living right in the middle of those two is amazing. And then just having this up here as like a reminder. Uh, one of the other things that we're really proud of accomplishing at Kayak Bass Fishing is the, the DZ KBF the 10. And uh, this is the first banner that we got made when we were um, bringing in a non-endemic sponsor. Non-endemic means outside of the industry. And just really excited, you know, about the progress of that concept. You know, it really is one of the things that I kind of overextended myself with in the sport. You know, and then when the tourism bureaus don't come through or sponsorships have to be reduced and things like that, and you have such a big commitment at the beginning of the year, uh, it's caused a bit of a domino effect. I'm not going to, you know, blow any smoke up anybody's skirt. I've owned it publicly. It is what it is. And hopefully we can just put our heads down, get through it, and make it a, um, a lesson learned as a business, as a business owner, and something that we never repeat in the future. So again, I've got these up here, you know, not to throw out a branding hit, but just to remind myself that, you know, this was one of the most challenging times we ever faced. That was the 2020 <laughs> national championship. And two weeks before the event, the state of Alabama went into lockdown and we couldn't do the national championship, but the state of Alabama said, we still want to do it. So we moved it from April 2nd, 3rd and 4th into October. We had over 350 anglers show up in the middle of one of the toughest times that this country has faced. So it does demonstrate the resiliency of this community. It does demonstrate the commitment that North Alabama has, Lake Gunnersville in particular said, no, we're doing it. Let's do it. And we did, I think we stayed in the fall a little bit too long, trying to balance out our schedule. And so that's why we're going back to the spring. Uh, but I really think that this, again, I, I know I'm just kind of getting a little bit philosophical here, but these are up for that very reason. And I just keep moving them around so that they're right in my face. Same with this, this board right here. You know, I had pretty much decided uh, this thing was trashed. It got melted by a heater on the side, but I cut it off and I mounted it to the wall because these guys right here, Yak Attack and Torquedo, um, are responsible for why kayak fishing is where it is now. Not just KBF, but kayak bass fishing. We never could have done the $100,000 national championship if it wasn't for the support of Torquedo. We never would have been able to continue doing the national championship or ever get my television show off the ground or ever take kayak fishing rigging to the level that it's at if it wasn't for the folks at Yak Attack. And another thing that people don't know about Yak Attack is Yak Attack has been fundamentally instrumental in the development of several of the major kayak companies out there. A lot of their parts and pieces and things have been designed and engineered and produced by Yak Attack. So Yak Attack has a much bigger impact and has had a much bigger impact than just making products that they sell and making rigging solutions. Yak Attack, you know, obviously Luther Cyphers, who's the, the founder and owner, uh, is one of my best and closest personal friends. And uh, so there's that. But the fact is, this guy has brought me along for the journey. It's been a privilege to know him and it's been a privilege to be associated with both of these companies because without Torquedo, there wouldn't be Bixby, there wouldn't be um, Newport Vessels, there wouldn't be, you know, Minn Kota's finally being put into old towns because, you know, Johnson Outdoors owned motors before the Torquedo existed, but they didn't put them into kayaks. So these two knuckleheads right here have really supported me and together KBF, Torquedo and Yak Attack have literally helped shape and change the future uh, of kayak fishing and so it'd be easy for me to throw my hands up in the air and say well this tournament thing's not working it's taken away from my content creation it's costing me money I'm just gonna quit 
so there's one thing I just want to look at you guys and tell you, especially the the folks that have bought into a lot of the stuff that's out there from the haters or the people that want to tear me down. I'm not quitting. <laughs> I'm too stupid to quit. And I'm also all in. When I sold my business, you know, back in 2016, I reinvested every bit of it in KBF. I overcommitted over the last year, had some unfortunate domino effect things happened, put us in a really rough spot. We're going to get through it. And then we're going to start back at zero and figure out what's best what's our best way to support and serve the community whether that's less tournaments whether that's no tournaments whether that's the right amount of tournaments probably a mix of all that but again this sign is here these signs are here those trophies are over there to remind me of where we came from to some of the things that we should be proud of accomplishing to this one specifically reminds me that like this is one of the toughest things i and we as a country as a company and as a community ever had to go through and if we can get through that we can get through anything Last one is kind of my office in here, like I talked about. Um, I'm a creative person. I, um, I've got my drafting and drawing desk in here that I haven't drafted or drawn on in years. I've got some of my artwork up there that I haven't messed with in a long time. And so it's time for me to kind of enrich my soul to do some of the things that I've neglected over the years. And I think it'll make me a better person. It'll make me a more balanced leader. Um, and it'll help me stay grounded, avoid being triggered, all those things. And so I'm gonna end this video with saying this. Um, why should you care about the kayak bass fishing headquarters? Why should you be vested in the success of kayak bass fishing? Um, I've got a lot of friends in this industry and last year, one of my really good and close friends was the global sales manager for Hobie. And we had a lot of conversations and he actually reached out to me to ask me my opinion on the Hobie Bass Open Series and whether they should do it or not. And I was like, you absolutely should do it. <laughs> you know, you should do it because it's beneficial to the brand, but the community deserves it. You know, from the outside looking in, a, a, a lot of people would probably think, well, dude, that's your opportunity to, you know, act like you don't want it to happen. And then there will be less competition for KBF, blah, blah, blah. But that's not how I think. I don't think in the me first mindset and, and I think the folks that know me and have known me for a long time understand that and so to me what's good for the sport is good for the sport and it doesn't matter what my personal benefit is it, in addition to that it's actually not good for the sport if a major series fails which is why it's so important to me to you know to fix the things with KBF that I've let slip or that I've miscalculated or whatever because it's not good for the sport for KBF to fail. It's not good for the sport for Hobie and the Hobie Bass Open Series to fail. Uh, I go all the way back to when the Kayak Bass Series was trying to come in and compete with KBF and they were struggling. I reached out to the gentleman that was running it, Terry Manley, and offered every bit of assistance I could to help them even though they were trying to compete with KBF because they had enough traction that I felt like it was important for them to succeed. And so for me, I'm not the guy that's out there bashing anybody else, any other series. If you're trying to help the kayak fishing community, I'm for it. Because if you're helping the kayak fishing community, you're helping my family. And if you're helping my family, how could I be against it, right? Whether it benefits me or hurts me professionally or financially, if I'm truly an advocate that I say I am for the sport before the business, before the brand, and before the Chad, then I'd be a hypocrite to not hope those things are successful. And so even to my own detriment, sometimes I push very hard for other things to be successful. And I hope that I never change. I don't commit, I commit to myself every day that I'm not going to change and I'm, I'm dedicated to it. I hope I never have to get to the point of self-preservation that I just have to focus on me first and, and say, screw what's good for the community because I'm all in on this thing, right? And, and I really believe that as a community, if we could all just come together and everybody is successful, it's better for the sport. If you're championing for or cheering for anybody to fail, not just KBF, then you're toxic and you shouldn't be uh, anointing yourself a leader in this sport. And I'm not just saying this because because of KBF and the struggles that we're going through. I'm saying this because I've said it from the beginning when we were the biggest and the best and whatever you want to call it till wherever we fall out in the spectrum now. So again, I wanna leave you with this. Why is the Kayak Bass Fishing Headquarters important? 
Well, if you're watching me as a knucklehead who loves the content that we share, it's going to allow me to make more of it. If you're interested in, you know, the, the insights that I can bring in from influencers and friends in the industry, then you'll benefit from it. So you should be for it. And more importantly, we don't need anything that's influential in the kayak fishing space or the fishing space in general to fail because it's not good for the sport that we all love. And that's not just me saying that because of I'm personally invested and all in and all that other good stuff. I've practiced that, I've preached that throughout my career in this space. And I hope you guys uh, understand and believe that, especially the ones of you guys that I care about, the ones that I don't, you're gonna do whatever you're gonna do and it is what it is. But so that's, that's it guys, that's the walkthrough of the KBF headquarters. The process of going through the vision, the, the process of making the adjustments and squeezing this thing out on a shoestring budget where folks are volunteering their time to help. It just really shows that the community is strong, the family is strong, the bond between you knuckleheads is strong. And I appreciate each and every one of you guys. I love you like you are my family because you are. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in the next video. And by the way, one kind of parting shot is Austin said well, before we started filming, he's like, you know why Gunnersville catches so many fish? Or you, what, what did you say? Actually, here, give me the camera. What, you tell them what you say. Give me the camera. What did you say? I said, do you want to know why Gunnersville has such good fish? Okay, yeah. And by the way, he was over there across the room when he said that. And he's like, because it looks like a zoom lizard. So if you really look at it, it kind of does. You got the legs. <laughs> and you got the curly yeah, you got the, yeah, you got it all. So anyway, you'll never look at a map of Gunnersville the same again. It looks like a zoom lizard. We'll see you guys in the next video. <laughs>